For those who see the world not as it is, but as it can be, who seek to make their vision of the future become reality, their mission is our mission. At Lockheed Martin, we never forget who we're working for. Until, until just a minute ago, somebody, one of you came up to me and said, is Bill Nye your real name? And I said, well, it's William Nye. And the guy said, well, why did you change it? I went, well, oh, man. No, it's great to see you all. Uh, here we are uh, on the planet Earth. If I say to you, what's your favorite planet, what do you say? There was a mix. How many people say Saturn? How many people say Pluto? Uh, how many people are upset that Pluto is no longer considered a planet? You guys, I love you all. But the one thing you can count on in science is that things change. So it used to be a planet. Now, instead of being the last of the traditional planets, Pluto is the first of a new class of objects, the Plutoids. Come on, it's fun. With that said, uh, this is the Earth. Actually, uh, it's a picture of the Earth. Uh, you know, I don't think the Earth would even fit in this room, to tell you the truth. Uh, but you may have seen this shot. I uh, was with my good friend, Neil deGrasse Tyson who is on the board of the Planetary Society, the organization I'm now CEO of, and this guy photobombed us. He jumped in the middle. Just, we were just taking a selfie, Neil and me, and this guy jumps in. I don't know, man. It started, it started an unfortunate chain of events, but uh, I took that with my phone. Now, if you told my father or my mother that I could walk around with a phone, and take pictures of the president, they would think you were, had at least, you'd at least be sleep deprived, if not just drunk or crazy. But now we do it all day, and then I've had a big year, along with the selfie with the president. Danica McKellen's here. Uh, I was on Dancing with the Stars. My buddy, good buddy Tyne Steckline, who right now is not on the show this season, she is instead dancing with Cher. So she's a little busy. There's Tyne. And then there I am dressed as the robot. And we all, we all accept that Bill could be dressed as a robot because, you know, we have robots everywhere. What's the big deal? Just Bill is a robot. And then also this year, I was on the Big Bang Theory. It's just, just it's cool. So, for, I know I see a lot of young people here, but for people our age, if I can use the term, I see some grown-ups. Bob Newhart is sort of a comedy god, right? So I'm on stage with Bob Newhart, and I'm trying to out-deadpan him. <laughs> Try to be more serious and not laugh more than Bob Newhart. Very challenging. But I just want to say everybody in the show is cool. They're lovely. It was really a, a peak experience. Also this year, as you may know, <laughs> uh, how many people watched that debate? Wow. How many people have never heard of it? Have no idea what we're talking about. All right, so there was uh, some issues with the guy who doesn't really believe in science. And uh, along this line, He's also the guy using his uh, influence to convince people that climate change is not really a problem, which is, uh, I got to tell you, I strongly believe that is not in anybody's best interest. And so uh, there are a lot, as you may know, climate change deniers in our society, but I'm hoping events like this will tip the tipping point and we can uh, push the climate deniers aside, dare I say it, work together, and 
change the world. Just for the record, I go way back with the climate change thing. It's my book from 1993, The Stuff Happens Show from around 2005 to 2008. And in all this, I did this uh, debate in Kentucky with the guy who generally doesn't much believe in science. And so then we thought that by attacking me, yes, Bill, <laughs> attacking me, climate change would not be a problem. It turns out, even if I'm not here, it's going to be an issue. And uh, for those of you, uh, just if I may give everybody of all ages a little perspective, in 1964, I went to the World's Fair in New York City. The town's so nice, they named it twice. And by the way, everybody, you know, I'm from Washington. I grew up in the city of Washington. Go Nationals! Uh, but with that said, they did have a uh, World's Fair in that other town for some reason. And my father, my brother, and my sister and I were disappointed. We arrived at the World's Fair right after this great big board, this great big um, total board or tote board, uh, that depicted the number of people in the world, the world's population. We missed it changing from 2,999,999,999 people to 3 billion people. In 1964, when I was at the World's Fair, I was somewhat younger than I am now, uh, there were 3 billion people in the world. Well, this morning, I had internet access. As of this morning, there are 7.2 billion people in the world. So everybody, that is the problem. There used to be half as many people in my lifetime. The population of the world has more than doubled. And uh, we can, right now, feed everybody because we've been working hard through the process of science to find ways to do more with less in agriculture. Uh, and I remind us all, while we are here at the Science and Engineering Festival, it is in the United States Constitution to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Now, as you, yes, as you may know, I am the science guy, but I'm also an engineer. I have a license for crying out loud. And I know it may surprise you because right now my pants are long enough. Yeah, but when, yeah, a lot of engineers have trouble with that. But the useful arts are what we need, everybody. The, the key to the future is not to do less, but to do more with less. And that's where I want the young people here to come up with new ideas, to innovate, and to, dare I say it, change the world. Now, when you look at a picture like this, you might think for a moment that it's out of focus. Because uh, when you look at the limb, the edge of the Earth in this picture, it looks blurry. But it's not out of focus, everybody. That's the Earth's atmosphere. That's the whole thing. If we had some extraordinary car on some extraordinary road, and we could drive straight up for an hour and a half, well, in DC traffic, uh, you drive straight up for about six hours, and then you'd be in outer space. It's that close. So it is that thinness of the Earth's atmosphere combined with the enormous number of us using the atmosphere to burn things and uh, breathe. A lot of people are into breathing. That, that is what's making climate change a serious issue. Now, there's another problem that has come to our attention at the Planetary Society that I want the young people here to solve. And in this case, to keep from changing the world. If you get a chance to go to Meteor Crater, Arizona, it is astonishing. Has anybody been to Meteor Crater? It is amazing. It's, you go, you park in a parking lot, you go through these glass doors. Relax, everybody. There's a Subway sandwich shop right there. And you go past some big meteorites that are big iron metal things, and then you walk along, and there's some displays about meteors and outer space, and then you go through these doors, 
And there's this hole. There's this enormous hole. More than a kilometer across. It's, if you put the Washington Monument in it, you'd just see the top. And this crater was made, we all believe, about 25,000 years ago. When I was in second grade at Lafayette Elementary, anybody? Lafayette Elementary? Then Alice Steele Junior High, anybody? Yes? Uh, Mrs. McGonagall in second grade said, she had a book, she had a big book. She's reading to us. The reason the ancient dinosaurs died out was because they had small brains. So then the mammals took all their food and the dinosaurs died. But even she knew that, that was just that was just lame. I mean, okay, you're a rabbit, and I'm a Tyrannosaurus. Oh, oh, sorry, it's a rabbit. So she knew that it was not a very good theory. Didn't seem reasonable. But in my lifetime, everybody, after I was a grown-up, out in the workforce, paying taxes, working at Boeing. People discovered, uh, don't, don't worry, I worked at Boeing at 747 airplanes, but don't worry, I was very well supervised. Don't worry, everything's cool. Uh, so uh, we came up with a much better theory as to what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. Almost certainly, a big meteor hit off the coast of Mexico, created an uh, enormous hole in the ground, and when you take this energy of a moving object and stop it, that energy becomes heat. So the ejected material, the rocks that came out of this hole, were bigger, the, the cone of the ejecta was bigger than the diameter of the Earth. So the Earth was, for a few days or a week, surrounded by red hot rock. It set the world on fire and the large organisms couldn't get through it. Uh, when I was in astronomy class, I'm not kidding everybody, with Carl Sagan, he, I, I really did, I, I was in his class, I'm pretty sure, by mistake. I think it is what we call a clerical error. And uh, I ended up in astronomy class, and he talked about the Tunguska event. And it was just called an event in those days. No one knew what happened. They went to this area, Siberia, in uh, June 30th, 1908, as reckoned on the modern calendar. Uh, the Earth was hit with this rock. Have you ever heard the story, if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and you hit the water, it'll be like concrete and it'll kill you? Uh, that's probably true, actually. Uh, I've never tried it. But the, uh, when a rock hits the Earth's atmosphere, the, it, the atmosphere can't get out of the way. So the rock just bursts, just explodes. That material gets very, very hot when you turn the energy of motion into the energy of, uh, of stopping. And uh, the, it exploded and blew down trees for hundreds of kilometers in every direction. And it wasn't, it was so remote, how remote was it? It was so remote that nobody went up there to take a picture for over a year. But the Tunguska airburst was a very significant thing when I was in astronomy class back in the disco era. But you all may recall last year on Valentine's Day, there was a rock that hit over Russia again. By the way, if you're a rock and you're going to hit the Earth from the north, there's a good chance you'll hit Russia. I mean, it's 11, it used to be 11 time zones wide, now it's nine, but it's huge. And so uh, this rock hit the Earth's atmosphere and the same thing happened, it exploded. Any metal material in the rock got so hot that it just oxidized, burned in the air. There's so much insurance fraud in Russia that there are enough dashboard cameras to record this event. And, uh, and then everybody went running to the windows to see the street going across the sky. And the sonic booms from this airburst, from this impact, didn't hit the ground for almost three minutes. Everybody's standing at the windows watching this amazing thing, and then wham! The glass gets thrown in their face, and then a thousand people went to the essentially the emergency room. Now that happened when a rock that was too small to do any damage. At the Planetary Society, we look for asteroids all the time. If that had hit Washington, that would be it for Washington. Yeah. What about what about uh, Montgomery Mall? Yeah, that too. Okay. Yeah. Tyson's Corner gone. Done. We're done. 
And so uh, we cannot let the Earth get hit with an asteroid. Everybody. This, uh, I was at this uh, big time thing called TED, the Entertainment Development Con Okay. And I brought this up. We don't want the Earth to get with an, hit with an asteroid. And they laughed like it's never going to happen. It's almost happened a few times in my lifetime. It is, by a reasonable reckoning, the only preventable natural disaster. So I want the young people here to figure out a way to give an asteroid just a little bit of a nudge, just a little, just a little nudge. Uh, by the way, you don't want to send Bruce Willis. I mean, he's a fine guy, but it, that's not the right thing. If you blow the asteroid up, it's very possible that some pieces of it will keep going and hit the Earth and it'll be even worse. We'll have one coming in even faster, and that's trouble. So what you might do, people have talked about, you go out there, park your rocket on the asteroid, and then you turn on the rocket engine. Oh, except, Doug, I'm sorry, it's in outer space, so it, it uh, doesn't make any sound, it's just... Uh, but this probably won't work because you can't get enough fuel. What these guys are, these people are obsessed with is changing the velocity. And so uh, in, when you subtract things in mathematics, you, you call it the difference. So we use the Greek letter delta to refer to change. You, we want delta V, change in velocity. Now, if an asteroid is going uh, 20 kilometers a second, 20,000 meters a second. We only have to deflect it generally about two millimeters a second. Just a 10 millionth of its velocity. Just that much, just that much. Because it's a four-dimensional problem. There's uh, east and west, north and south, up and down, and then there's time. You want the asteroid to cross the Earth's orbit when we are not there. So we at the Planetary Society have a little idea for you you young people who are going to solve this problem, the laser bees. So these are small spacecraft with solar panels on them. The solar panels soak up sunlight, uh, make electricity to drive lasers, and then we zap the surface of the asteroid. <laughs> Except it's in outer space. Just. And then the ejected material has momentum, has a little nudge, and it'll just push the asteroid uh, out of the way. If the asteroid's spinning, which they're all tumbling a little bit, uh, you can turn the lasers off for a few moments while it's reflecting the wrong direction, turn them back on, turn them off, turn them back on, and they would be hooked up to, uh, by radio uh, like a cell phone network. They would work together. If one of them breaks, you turn it off. If one of them's working a little better, you move it into a hotter position. This would be nothing but fun. And I want you all to solve this problem. By the way, the more we learn about asteroids, the better. So we are sending the OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu, recently named. And if you want to get your name on the spacecraft, which is fun, please consider joining the Planetary Society, visiting our website, planetary.org, and then you can find it quickly with slash Bennu. And you can get your name on it and send it your name out into deep space. And we're going to bring back a piece of an asteroid, which we strongly believe will give us great insight into the origin of the solar system. There are two questions that everybody always asks. And if there's somebody out here who says he or she has never asked that question, I don't believe you. And the two questions are, where did we come from and are we alone? And if you want to answer those two questions, you have to explore space. So that's why we're sending a mission to, uh, to uh, asteroid Bennu. Now, I, as you may know, through my connection to Cornell University after I took astronomy and then I joined the Planetary Society, then as you may know, I left the room a couple years ago. I came back and now I'm the CEO. But I had a little job on the Mars rovers, 
and I worked on this photometric calibration target. This thing is only this big, and if you go to our website, you can download a paper version of it. It's this big, and it casts a shadow. And if you've never done this, go outside on a sunny day, and we, we have some scheduled later this week, uh, next week, and look at the shadow cast by anything, your, your finger, a pen, your friend's head, whatever you got, and you'll see the shadow isn't just gray. On Earth, it's a little bit blue. Well, on Mars, it's quite red or rusty or orange colored. And so I got involved in this uh, because my father was very involved in sundials, and I was jumping out of my chair. We got to make the photometric calibration target into a sundial. And these guys were all looking at me. You know, Bill, it's a space program. You know, we don't need, we don't need sundials. No, it'll be cool. We can reckon time on another world. So you guys, there are three sundials on Mars. Uh, here's the Curiosity rover one up close. Its motto is to Mars to explore. On the uh, sundial should have a motto. My father would remind you of that. Uh, and the ones on the Spirit and Opportunity rover, oh, here it is, it's, it's right there. Uh, that's the uh, self-portrait taken with the hand lens imager. And the Mars dial is right there. And if you go to the Smithsonian today, I don't know why you'd leave this place, but maybe later, you can go see the display about the Spirit and Opportunity rovers and the uh, Mars dial, that's the flight spare, as it's called, the, the leftover one, is there in a case. And if you go to Mars, and I hope you all do, around the edge of the Mars dial, is a message to the future. And it's the first message to the future that humans have sent into space since the Voyager mission. Anybody watching Cosmos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since the Voyager spacecraft mission uh, missions back when Cosmos was being created. And then it, the Cosmos aired in 1980. Uh, and it says, we built these spacecraft in our year 2003. They arrived here in 2004. We built these instruments to study the Martian environment, look for signs of water and life, to learn about Mars past, prepare for our future. And then it says, to those who visit here, we wish a safe journey and the joy of discovery. And my friends, that is the essence of science. That is why we all pursue this, to feel that joy of discovery. Now, everybody in this room was here when a significant discovery was made just two months ago. In the uh, late 1920s, Edwin Hubble went to Mount Wilson in, uh, up above Pasadena, California. When you're at Mount Wilson, you can take a tour and you can look down on the, uh, on the New Year's Eve, I mean the New Year's Day uh, Rose Parade. And he discovered that the universe is expanding. It's moving apart from itself in every direction. And do you know why? Nobody knows why, but it is. And then you can go to Basking Ridge, New Jersey, and see the horn antenna, this enormous thing. Do you see the two guys standing there? Where they listen to the microwave background radiation that was exactly as predicted by theories about the Big Bang, the beginning of the expanding universe. And so in your lifetime, two months ago, researchers in Antarctica, using very specialized telescopes, found further evidence that this business of the cosmological constant uh, is uh, associated with the Big Bang is exactly as predicted. In other words, people are getting closer to understanding how the universe started, what we know is the universe, and how we all got here. So, you know, everybody these days studying the expanding universe, uh, just in 2004, which wasn't that long ago, people discovered that the universe isn't just expanding, it's accelerating. And do you know why it's accelerating? Nobody knows why. And so, it could be, people will say, well, that's because there's dark matter that has gravity that's pulling the universe apart, and it's driven by dark energy. Well, nobody knows what dark matter and dark energy are. But it could be in your lifetime that will be discovered, that will be figured out, and that will allow you to, dare I say it, change the world. 
This is uh, me on my, the roof of my house. Actually, it's a picture of me. I'm, I'm over here. I'm here. That's a picture of me. And behind me are my solar panels. And in front of me is my solar hot water system and my solar tube dome, which directs light down into the room below. I still go in there eight years later trying to turn the lights off. It's so bright. Now, those solar panels are about 15% efficient. My watch is solar powered. I never wind it. This solar panel is about 10% efficient. Whoa. If we had solar panels that were 50% efficient, 60, 70, 80% efficient, it would, dare I say it, change the world. And so what I want you all to do is figure this out. There is enough wind energy in North Dakota to power all of North America, US, Canada, Mexico. If we could just somehow capture that energy and store it and distribute it around North America. I want you all to solve that problem. Uh, as you may know, I drive an electric car, and the electric car is pretty cool, but its limitation is its range, how far you can drive, and the limitation is the batteries. If you all could invent a better battery, you would, of course, improve the quality of life for everyone on Earth. But you would also get rich. <laughs> Crazy rich, like Bill Gates rich, like the head of Ikea guy rich. So I want you to figure out how to do this. We can store energy in cars if they have good batteries. People have talked about the liquid metal battery. This is a battery that has molten magnesium, the very lightweight metal on top of a layer of molten salt, and then underneath it is a layer of molten antimony, or antimony. It's the one next to tin on the periodic table. Hey, did you enjoy? They might be giants. Yes, the elements. Anyway, the big limitation of most batteries is they get hot. You pump energy into them, and uh, they get too hot, and they don't conduct electricity as well. They don't store electricity as well. But these are batteries that get hot on purpose. If we could have those in the basement of buildings like this, in the basement of uh, every large building at the end of every city block, store energy in there while the wind's blowing and the sun's shining during the day, take it out at night, distribute it around the world through a smart electrical grid, one that knows where everybody is, knows where the cars are parked, just like we know how many toilets flush at halftime. We can know where the cars are and store energy and park cars. It could be such an extraordinary way to do more with less. This picture was sent to the Library of Congress in November, along with Carl Sagan's papers. It's a picture of Saturn's rings as taken by the Cassini spacecraft. But as you may know, it's also a picture of the Earth. The Earth is right there. That's the whole thing. So my friends, it's just sobering to think that we humble humans sent a spacecraft into deep space, took a picture of our own world. We can see how tiny it is, how fragile it is. And the message is that there's nobody coming over the hill to save us. If we contaminate the Earth so that we, the billions of us who live here no longer can, that will be trouble. So instead of letting that happen, I want the young scientists and engineers here to innovate, to come up with new ideas, and dare I say it, change the world. So with that said, you guys, let's, uh, let's do some science. Whoa, uh, I have a lab coat, thank goodness. Uh, now the key to doing more with less, everybody, is to find new ways to t make use of energy. Now I have here, we're a little limited, I have here a uh, styrofoam, uh, styrofoam uh, cylinder, container. Actually, for anybody who takes calculus, this is a frustrum, big fun. This is an engine that has two pistons 
a big one made of foam and a little one made of rubber. And I'm going to put in the uh, styrofoam base, I'm going to put a little liquid water and some ice, regular old ice. And then when I put this Stirling engine, which was invented by the Stirling brothers, patented in 1807, the Stirling engine originally was not made of plexiglass. The cold ice is somehow enough to drive the engine. Now, I could tell you that I'm doing this with my mind, and it's magic. But I hope you wouldn't believe me. Instead of magic, it's yes, yes, people. So here's my question. Where is the energy coming from to drive the Stirling engine? Uh, you, don't, I'll, you don't have to yell it out, but the key is the heat in the room. What makes any heat engine go, like the heat engine in your car, which runs on burning gasoline or diesel fuel, the steam engines that drive the power plants that make our electricity from PEPCO, Pot uh, Potomac Electric Power Company, uh, they all work by taking the energy of heat and converting it to motion, to uh, spinning things. So what's making this engine go is the heat of the room. The heat of the room has enough temperature difference between the top and the bottom, the ice in the bottom, to drive this engine. Now, Stirling engines are very, very efficient, but they have a drawback. You can't speed them up or slow them down. But perhaps you all out here will use this technology developed in the 1800s, understand it a little better, use different materials, and make extremely efficient ways to produce electricity, with which you could, dare I say it, change the world. So now, for those of you uh, who are uh, followers of the Planetary Society, I'm going to bring out our extraordinary journalist to uh, help me with some science dem demonstrations. Ladies and gentlemen, Emily Lakdawalla. Emily. Oh, Danica. Danica's here. I was backstage with Emily. She's singing along to every They Might Be Giant song. Yes. So, before we get started, yes. I want to bring on a special surprise guest. A special surprise guest? Miss Danica McKellar. Danica, oh, yes. <laughs> math. Math doesn't suck. Dang, yes, hi. Right. And we'll do this. <laughs> so, uh, you're on Dancing with the Stars. Yes, I am. I know. And, and you've gotten injured. Yes. We have so much in common. Uh, yeah. We already had a lot in common. I watched the show Bill Nye the Science Guy when I was a kid. I love it you, was, man. It was a huge inspiration for me to write my math books to inspire girls, yes. making math and science fun, yes. awesome. And now, both on Dancing with the Stars, both, both with injuries. Both with injuries, what but you can secret, keep going. What was your secret to being so sexy the whole time you were on the show? Being so sexy. Yeah. <laughs> Danica, I love this. Uh, I guess you gotta let you gotta let the music be in you, yeah, okay. and it's got to get out. <laughs> it's got to get out. That's what Val keeps telling me. Uh, that's Val. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Well, he's, yeah. you know, he's right over there. Oh, Val is here. Oh, he's he course is. he's here, man. Yeah, come on Sorry, up. you guys. Hi. <laughs> wow. Great to see you, dude. Hi. I mean, I know you all hear this, but when you work on this show, you spend so much. That's Emily, Val. You spend so much time together. You become like a family. Family. Yep. Yes, but of course we were on different seasons, so we didn't really cross paths. But now, now we have this in common. My leg is almost back. Is it? Is it's it? It's not quite back okay. even now. Oh, but man. your rib is broken. It's don't broken. hug you very much. Yeah, don't hug me too much. But you're still going to compete, right? I'm going to try. Yes, you guys yes, to yes. Val yeah. will take care of you. He'll come up with something. We need, we need your votes. We please, we need your votes. My, my dance is not going to be the same, but we'll try. Your dancing's pretty cool. So, Danica, let's see. What can we talk about mathematically? What we'll do, um, uh, we'll have, um, um, Danica, I tell you, ice because bath. you're, I you're ice in the red, every day after and, practice, and Emily's in the white, right now. Uh, the ice bath's coming up. <laughs> Hang on, we, I happen to have a, uh, some equipment here. Uh, do you recognize this, Danica? Say candle. Yes! Now, Danica, stand if you yes. would over here. Uh, now, the candle, just to understand, it looks fine, right? Yeah. But if you got carried away, yeah. 
You could take the candle and set the stage on fire. I could. And that would like set the building on fire. Yeah. And then the fire would spread like all over Washington and then you'd like set the whole East Coast on fire. That's but, a horrible idea. But, but don't do that. I won't do that. Yeah. I won't do that. So here you go. Emily, you can if you me. would. What are we doing? What are Emily, we doing? please go down to the uh, what many people would think is a trash can. Wow, it's really windy up here. Uh, it's, yeah, okay, it's a candle. Okay. You'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> so now Emily is going to thwap the trash can of science which turns out to be have special properties. So what I'd like you to do, Danica, is get the candle about in line. Uh, Emily, can you twist the cart to show the audience what we're dealing with here? It's a precision trash can with a shower curtain dra uh, taped on the other end. What's happening? Then uh, she's going to flap the uh, membrane. Yeah. And uh, we are hopeful, yes. Three, two, one. Yes! First time! Danica, <laughs> hang in there, hang in there. You've got a broken rib. We don't want you jumping around too much. Okay. Now, Val, uh, come on over. Uh, uh, do you recognize this? Yes. What, what is this? This is a balloon. It looks like a balloon. Please hold it. But I think upon closer inspection, you can see that this is actually a fish. <laughs> Clearly a fish. Clearly. So now, if you would, Val, uh, hold the fish upstream of the candle in the line of fire of Emily's okay. precision trash can of science. <laughs> no. Nope. Uh, no, on the other upstream. upstream. Yeah. There we go. All right, Emily, count them down. Three, two, one. Whoa. <laughs> Val, Val. We're, yeah, no, you, we were hoping a little more firmly, yeah. <laughs> but from <laughs> below, to allow the airstream to flow around the precision fish of science. Right. Okay. There I'm you go. Three, we'll just two, go. one. Whoa. Yeah. Thank you, Danica. Okay. Val is brilliant. You can stick around if you want. We're going to have nothing but fun. Uh, you don't have safety glasses, so we'll take care of you. Uh, oh, yeah, hold it. I'm, with you guys here, I got so excited. Everybody, ask yourselves, Danica, yeah. what is the shape of the pulse of air coming from the precision trash can of science? You might, shape? Yeah, you might think it's a sphere. Right. A sphere. You might think it's a bullet shape. A circle could be a circle. So what we will do is we will use our uh, theater fog machine shown here to, whoa, we'll go this way, to load the uh, precision trash can with uh, fog. Now, you guys, I have breathed this uh, theater fog for many years, and you can see I'm fine. <laughs> so now, Emily, if you would, gently show the audience the true shape of the air as it comes out of the uh, trash can. And I, st wow, it's windy in here. It's worse. Whoa. So Emily, go ahead and, uh, and nail the people. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> interact with the people. So here's the strange thing, everybody. When you're on a surfboard, you're on a boat, and a wave goes under you, the boat goes up and down, right? This is wave motion. Mm -hmm. But notice in this case, we have a ring of air moving through the air. Yeah. It's a vort. It's a, the people call it a vortex ring, a whirlpool ring, and you can be, you can uh, not like fluid mechanics. <laughs> you cannot like math. You cannot like ballroom dancing. You cannot like anything. You can be a miserable everything hater person, but these are just cool. <laughs> So now, uh, Val and Danica, uh, if you would, let's, uh, let's reproduce the demonstration with the matches that we have not misplaced. And you'll see that unless the ring hits the candle, 
I tell you what, you got. Let's move upstream. We're in the we're in a freaking uh, yeah, the hurricane again. There you go. Yeah. So now, let's see if we can get the ring to miss the first time. Oh well, that's a pretty, pretty extreme. <laughs> see if you can go right through the center, Danica. Whoa! Whoa! God. The air conditioning is conditioning. Whoa! Okay. So now, yeah. So, but look, the ring went right around it, and it's still burning. Now, see if you can get the edge of the ring to head it, hit it. Whoa! Whoa! Yes! Brilliant! Thank you. Uh, you can stick around. We got. We actually have a flight we have to catch. You have to catch a flight. Yes. Did you get a big net? Very big. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much for coming. I would hug you. I don't want to hurt you. And we'll do this. And then we'll do the one arm hug because we're such guys. He took care of me one day on the cha cha. And you see how well I did. But you guys, thank you so much for coming by. Thank Support you. Danica. Support girls in science. Danica, let me just leave you with this one thought. As you know, my mother was recruited by the US Navy because the family myth was she was good at math and science. Now, everybody, when I was growing up, when I went to engineering school, there were very, very few women. <laughs> very few. There were none, all right, whatever. But half of the humans are women. Science is the best idea humans have ever had, so half the scientists should be women. Yes? So go get them. Emily Lockdewall, Danica, carry on. Val, take care of her, man. Take care of her. See you guys later. Walk safely. Dance your stars. It'll be fun. We'll dance. I can't walk. She can't breathe. Cool. All right. Speaking of breathing, uh, we have here, we are hopeful that we have here, ah, yes, my colleagues, uh, Matt and the guy number 604, whom I don't know. Great. Th fabulous. We have here a, a doer which is a British word named after a guy for thermos. This seems to be a very large one, and it is filled with liquid nitrogen. Emily, I tell you what, do you have your glasses on? Yeah. Oh, Matt's here. Okay. Matt, do you have glasses? Yeah, okay. No, I don't. Yeah, no, yes, you do. Those will yes, work. Those are fun. Uh, the, this is liquid nitrogen. Some of you may be familiar. Matt and I are going to pour it into the styrofoam cooler of science. It's a clear liquid. It's minus 196 Fahrenheit, but more importantly, uh, minus 196 Celsius, more importantly, uh, minus 320 Fahrenheit. Okay, uh, there it is. And the, you'll notice the lid doesn't seal, because if it did, it would explode. <laughs> so this material. It scares me when you say stuff like that. <laughs> but you kind of, you know, just a little. So we're going to roast some marshmallows. And we're going to uh, prepare, or I think in cooking they would say finish. We'll finish some graham crackers uh, in the liquid nitrogen. And uh, it's big fun to uh, give people an idea of how cold stuff is. Uh, this is a balloon filled with air in my uh, lungs. Whoa. Yeah, I was really good at knots in the old days. So I put the balloon in the liquid nitrogen. Emily, have you ever done this? I have not. I can't say enough good things. Get it to shrink, and then when you hold it up to the audience, uh, you'll see the liquid air in the bottom. That'll be a mixture of the gases in the air. Ox liquid oxygen freezes, or turns to liquid rather, more easily than nitrogen. And there's some, gonna be some uh, argon and uh, carbon dioxide and all the exciting stuff. Now, if you do that with the same kind of thing, like a happy uh, uh, racquetball ball, racquetball balls, for those unfamiliar, bounce. But after they get, if I may use the term, wicked cold, uh, they don't. Now, we had another thing. It's all right. Uh, the racquetball ball is boiling. When you have this stuff, if anybody wants to get it, uh, you can touch it just for a moment. I, myself personally, speaking for myself, 
recommend against wearing gloves because if the stuff gets in the glove, ah, blah, blah. but uh, what's great about liquid nitrogen is it looks so fantastically dangerous, but it's, it's not bad. Uh, so I think this will work. Emily, if you would, can you hold the ball, uh, throw it on the floor? Oh, it didn't break. <laughs> nice catch. Uh, you'll, heard, you'll notice that it made a different sound. Uh, because it was solid as a rock. Now, Emily, we have here some uh, roast um, graham crackers. Ooh, woo. I'll get one. There you go. You got to move quickly, my friend. And then uh, we will we will chew them, and it's big fun. You know, Graham crackers work really well, but just from a comedy standpoint, a marshmallow is kind of funnier. It starts out soft and happy, but when you do this with them, sorry, I never get tired of it. Now, I'll just show you um, the remarkable properties of this stuff. We'll pour a little on the floor, and you can see it boiling immediately. Now, uh, when I uh, first started doing the Science Guy, the very first television Science Guy bit I ever did was the household uses of liquid nitrogen. Because we all have it around. You know, and this just these are just some tips. So I recommend roasting a marshmallow, and I uh, nope, I recommend the uh, the uh, graham cracker. <laughs> now well, there's going to be another object, but I don't see it. So now, Emily, talking about energy, let's bring. I think we can lift it over this. We're going to bring the roadway of science out here. Oops. Oh, you got to grab it by the post, Jim. Yeah. There we go. All right. Go on down there. This is the, for those of you who don't have one, this is the miniature roadway of science. Now, here is an electric generator. Emily, I believe you have one. I have my own. When I turn this crank, this little uh, generator in here, which looks in every way exactly like an electric motor, will turn. You know, we don't need these right now, unless you just love them. So I will now connect this uh, lead to Emily's lead. Emily will connect hers there we go. to mine. So Emily, turn the crank. Wait a minute. That's like magic. But it's not magic, it's yes. Now, I, Emily, if you don't mind, I'd like to put, put you to a little bit of mechanical work. All right. I'm always happy to She work. has the uh, generator. I have the series of lights. We would, uh, for everybody in the audience, we tried to get a smaller demonstration, but this was the smallest one we could find. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what I'd like Emily to do, these are conventional light bulbs from a conventional flashlight. She's going to turn it, and the light bulb lights. Do you have a sense of how bright it is? Yeah, you have a sense of how bright it is. Then I tighten the second one, and perhaps you can hear, hold it near your microphone. You can hear she's working harder. I tighten the third one, and she's, you're almost, she's just barely able to hang on. Yeah. And then the fourth one. And you see how the four of them are dimmer than the first one because she's working four times as hard to convert electricity, mechanical work rather, into electricity and then into light. How did I get this job done? Uh, well, do you want me to have it? And you take this one. All right. This is a light bulb represented by a great many light emitting diodes strung together. Oh, here we go. Strung together in a string, <laughs> strung together in a string. And just watch how bright it is 
and how easy it is for me to turn this. Wait, you still have it? Bill's acting all confident. Is it not going? It's not going. They're, they're just not connected, is what I hope. Yeah, there we go. It's in the details. All failures are mechanical failures. Uh, this is really unsatisfying. <laughs> oh, it could be. Oh, shoot, heavens. Dude. Dude. Yes, the wrong polarity. I had them marked, but not very well. <laughs> now... Yeah, sorry, there you go. Sorry. Great idea, Bill. But you see how easy it is to turn compared with the other ones. Now, these were invented in my lifetime. They are about 15 times as efficient as the old-style light bulbs. Just think if we suddenly had 15 times as much energy as we do now. We could, dare I say it, change the world. Yes, so let's clear the track. Clear the oh, track. Clear track. I got it. I'm reluctant to call this the most exciting thing ever in the universe. But here we have no, not. <laughs> we have a conventional radio powered car, which I have modified to include a capacitor. This is an electronic component that stores electricity. So we can now. Uh, using one of the generators, Bill. Here we go. Let's see, this can't be that hard. I should be able to do this. Thank you. I will now uh, put electrical energy into the capacitor on the toy car of science. I will crank it up. I'm working hard. I'm working. I'm reluctant to say I'm exhausted, but I'm working hard. Is the polarity correct? No. <laughs> Bill, dude. So you have to hook the plus to the plus. It's something they have. And the minus to the minus. I think they were correct. Just twist it. Yeah. So I'm putting energy in there. And to show you that I'm putting energy in, if I let go, some of the energy comes back out. So we're putting energy into the car. And then we will connect the car to the motor through these uh, electrical leads here. I'm sorry, I was trying to get something smaller. This is the smallest thing I could get. And we will uh, connect the leads to the precision electrical storage system of science, the capacitor. I will throw the switch, and nothing happens. Pretty impressive. Glad you guys have time for this. <laughs> No, it's frustrating. Well, there's, there's energy in there. Yep. So you want me to go like this? Is that what you're telling me? Could be. To take off the parking brake? Uh, the parking brake. Good idea. That could be what's wrong, actually. The switch underneath may be thrown. I did not check that. There is a switch underneath. Yes! <laughs> Wow, Bill, that was really great. <laughs> My point being that we can convert mechanical work into electricity in an efficient way. We could store electricity in cars, use electric vehicles, and revolutionize our transportation system. We could do more with less. You all could, dare I say it, change the world. Now, you can argue in the bigger picture that cars themselves are inefficient. But the DC Metro is pretty good. It's remarkable. I mean, uh, it carries a lot of people every day. The billing system, I admit, is a little chin strokey, But uh, <laughs> the idea is pretty great. So what I'd like to do now, uh, to talk again about the remarkable, the remarkable energy in heat. I guess we'll leave that right there. This thing has been running the whole time, just on ice, just the heat of the room, which I admit for the size of this thing is virtually limitless. The heat of the room is driving the Stirling engine. While we've been up here, we've had this ordinary oil drum of science 
uh, heating on the burner. And what we will do, the way anybody does, is notice that with these two burners running, a little bit of water, just two liters of water, were put in the bottom of the oil drum. And they've been boiling this whole time, getting the whole drum quite hot. Uh, and the steam has driven out all of the air, or virtually all of the air. So you may not remember this, but water vapor is a gas just like all the other gases in the air, the oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, argon, xenon, helium, everybody's favorite, uh, maybe the occasional astatine. And so uh, what we can do, Matt, can we turn the burners off? Are the burners off? Nope. Please turn them off. Yeah. And so uh, this is Matt Kaplan, our radio announcer on uh, Planetary Radio. He's turned the burners off. This is called a bung. I'm not kidding for you barrel buffs. And we will put the bung, and I'm not kidding, into the bung hole. The bung goes in the bung hole. Thank you, especially. Safety first. And we will um, tighten the bung with this happy pair of uh, gas pliers or uh, locking pliers, won't we, Bill? We'll do it right away, Bill. We won't screw around. We will make it go, Bill. There we go. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on, Bill. It's hot. There you go. We want it to be tight. Did I mention that? Spread them. No, it's just show a little skill. There we go. Sound effects help. Ah! There we go. All right. We strongly believe that's hot enough. I mean, and tight enough. Now we will, for fun, put the uh, can, the drum, full of water vapor into the kiddie pool of ice. Of science. Of science. We will spin the oil drum. You can hear the ends going in. We will continue to spin the oil drum in the ice water. We uh, tried this last year, and there were some issues. Ah! Yes. It's not magic, it's science. Thank you all so much for coming, thank you. That's awesome. Atmospheric pressure crushed it like a giant's fist. Thank you all, we'll see you soon.